Tonight we're going to report a story that's almost 80 years old, but it will come as news to most Americans as, frankly, it did to us. This country's most violent race riot didn't happen in Newark or Watts or Detroit. It happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in June of 1921. For decades, city officials covered it up. The history books barely mentioned it, and people, white people that is, hardly ever talked about Tulsa burning. But all that's changing now. The state commission has begun investigating the riot and is already raising tough questions about what today's citizens owe yesterday's victims. And it's revived memories for George Monroe of a night 78 years ago when his mother saw four white men walking up to their house carrying torches. A mother told us to get up under the bed and we got up under the bed. We could just see just their feet. They came in and set fire to the curtains and one stepped on my fingers and my sister put her hand over my mouth to be sure to stop me because she could tell I was fixing to holler because it hurt. Monroe escaped with some sore fingers. His home and the rest of Tulsa's black neighborhood, called Greenwood, was burning. Before the riot, 10,000 blacks lived in Greenwood, did business there, prospered there. In fact, Greenwood was one of the nation's most vibrant black communities. But children quickly learned that they lived in a different world from whites. The tracks was a dividing line. Now, every Sunday, we would climb on top of the coal car and throw enough coal on the side of, on, on our side, and I guess they did the same thing, but every Sunday we had a good coal fight. We would throw at them and they would throw at us. Like a, a kid's little riot? That's a good description of it, like a kid's riot. That's right. The kids, of course, learned from the adults. There was total segregation, wasn't there? Oh, that was the wonder of it all. Uh, it, it, after Oklahoma became uh, a state, the first law passed by the Oklahoma legislature was Senate Bill 1 that completely segregated the state. Don Ross represents Greenwood today in the state legislature. He's one of the prime movers behind the campaign to uncover Tulsa's dirty little secret. How old were you when you heard about the riot of 1921? I was 15 and in high school. You hadn't heard about it until you were 15? Never heard, didn't believe it. What Ross heard then is that on the morning of May 30th, a young black man got into the elevator of a building downtown and that the elevator operator, a 17-year-old white girl, screamed. The Tulsa Tribune, which was the afternoon daily newspaper, printed a fantastic write-up of this event. They had a front-page story that said, nab negro for attacking girl within the next hour there's lynch talk on the streets of tulsa historian scott ellsworth has been studying the tulsa riot for 20 years it's not just an academic quest for ellsworth he was born and raised in tulsa so the word of a lynching was out in the streets whites started gathering how, how were blacks reacting great concern i mean everybody knew what was about to happen Many of Tulsa's blacks were veterans of the First World War and armed. A group went to the courthouse and offered to help defend the jail and its black prisoner. The sheriff told them to go home. And as they're leaving, a white man goes up to a tall black vet and says, where are you going with that gun, nigger? And the vet says, I'm going to use it if I have to. The white man says, like hell you are, give it to me. A struggle, a shot goes off. The worst riot American history begins. Just about then, as dusk was settling in, Venice Sims was getting ready for her high school prom. Had a beautiful dress. She was everything new. And even some borrowed pearls. The seamstress had let me have her borrowed pearls to wear. Everything. Do you have a boyfriend? Sure. Secretly. <laughs> we didn't, my daddy didn't lie us to court. But I had one. And then you're supposed to go to the prom, and what happens? Well, that's when the riot, you know, that's when it started. And that's when the bullets started falling. 
Miss Sims, her family, and many Greenwood residents got out of town during the night. Others stayed and fought, but by dawn, they were overwhelmed. Right before dawn, as many as 10,000 whites descended upon Black Tulsa. Opening fire? Opening fire. Um, there was a block-by-block -block battle throughout the black community. They would uh, force the occupants of a house out. If people resisted, they were murdered on the spot. The homes were looted, and uh, then they were set fire to. Did the white authorities do anything to try to prevent this or They'd, control it? They don't. They spend most of their time arresting blacks and disarming blacks, preventing them from defending their homes and businesses, taking them to these internment centers around town. Sounds like an early a precursor of ethnic cleansing. Absolutely. Kenny Booker's father hid his wife and five children in the attic just before armed whites came to the front door. We could hear him from the attic talk to him, said, Negative, you have a gun? I think he said no. And he, he said, Don't set my house on fire, please. He didn't tell him why. But after he left, not long after he left, to set it on fire, and we had to scramble down and hurry. And his sister, the six years old, she said, is the world on fire, Kenny? I said, I don't know, but we're in trouble, deep trouble. The trouble came from the air, too. Investigators say some of the fires you see in this rare footage of the riot were caused by whites dropping explosives from World War I vintage planes flying over Greenwood. The flames destroyed almost every home and business in Greenwood, 35 square blocks in all. We didn't have no home. Everything was burned. All over there where we live, just burned down to the ground. Late in the day, martial law was declared and National Guard troops patrolled the streets. The dead were everywhere, the bodies lying where they fell. Photographers turned some of their grisly pictures into souvenir postcards. Most of the dead were buried quickly in unmarked graves around town. But some apparently were laid to rest here in Tulsa's Oaklawn Cemetery in this anonymous section reserved for paupers. There were no funerals, the authorities outlawed funerals. There were no coffins, no headstones, no records of the burials. But a ten-year-old boy saw it all. Clyde Eddy walked by the cemetery with a friend, saw some men digging and some big wooden crates. And we went in, naturally, and walked up to the first one and raised the lid up. There were three bodies of black men in it, just thrown in there. And we went over to another crate, a larger crate, and raised the lid on it. And uh, there was four bodies in this one. And there was, let's see, one, two, there's either four or five more boxes scattered around. And uh, about that time, one of the men saw us. And he run us out. The newspapers didn't think the mass graves deserved many headlines. And the White City Fathers, proud of their booming oil town, wanted to bury the story along with the bodies. The official version, typos and all, came in a National Guard report. It said there were 35 dead, nine whites and 26 blacks. But that number just keeps on rising. We think now that something like 300 people were killed in this. How many people were left homeless by the riot? Oh my gosh, uh, 10,000 people were left homeless by the riot. How many of those were white? None. The survivors lived in tents and shacks which they built themselves. My brother was 14 at the time, and he helped my father install wood. It was raining, as, far as I can remember, it rain, rain, rain. It seemed like it was a rain, rain, and we had a wooden floor in our tent. We were lucky to have that. But Tulsa's whites gave them something, promises. Now, in fact, after the riot, the city's white establishment said it was going to rebuild Greenwood. What happened? They lied. Not a dime. They proceeded, they proceeded to pass a fire ordinance that said, in effect, that you cannot build on property that had been burned. They wanted to starve blacks out of the land. They made it known to all philanthropic groups, we don't want your money. We will take care of our own. And there will be no problem. They spoke. They lied. Courts and insurance companies paid some damage claims, claims filed by whites. All black claims were rejected. A grand jury filed no charges against whites. 
57 blacks were indicted for rioting, and in fact, they'd put up one hell of a fight. In my community among those su survivors, they won the riot. They won it. You know, only, only till they brought airplanes in and dropped bombs and fire bombs and brought the National Guard in could they subdue my people. That's the view from the black community, that airplanes and National Guard saved them white folk. We were winning. For Ross, setting up a legislative commission to study the riot was a way of keeping that pride alive. Eddie Fay Gates is one of the members. It said history is the lie agreed upon. Well, somebody agreed not to tell the story of the riot in Tulsa. At first, there was denial, you know. It didn't happen. It wasn't that bad. Now, Tulsa and Oklahoma's way past the denial stage. The commission is looking for the truth by looking for the dead. But Greenwood is looking for more than just some unmarked graves. Somebody has to pay when they do wrong. Uh, if you don't, if there's no penalty for wrongdoing, there's no incentive for societies to do the right thing. Who should get reparations, the 60 or 70 survivors or the descendants of all the people who were wronged at the time? My wish list, which I don't think we'll ever get, would be that there would be adequate monetary uh, payments to survivors, the living survivors. For the descendants, maybe scholarships, scholarships for the college-age children of, of these descendants. Uh, the sons don't pay for the sins of the fathers. They pay for their only their own sins. State Representative Bill Graves opposed setting up the commission and thinks Tulsa should put the past where he says it belongs, in the past. The statute of limitations is run uh, on the people here involved that were injured. What would you say to one of the survivors who would say to you, lost my home, lost everything my family had worked for? I'd have to tell them that I didn't think they have any right to uh, money from the legislature. This is a tragic thing that happened to them. Uh, tragic things happen to other people. It are, seems unjust to us, yet we have to live with them. What do you think should come out of this? A memorial? I have no problem with a memorial that uh, uh, these people should be, I think, remembered and honored for, for what they had to go through. Don Ross says he doesn't need a memorial. He's already got one. His anger. I feel strongly if I'm ever satisfied with whatever we do, that I will let down some people who educated me in my life and who died angry. I am their living memorial, my anger is. But George Monroe, the kid with the sore fingers, has a longer view about reparations, about monuments, and about everything that's happened and not happened in Tulsa since that dark day in 1921. It's still here, even today in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Segregation is still here. It's, it's still here. But it's loosening up a little bit now. So 75 years after the riot, segregation is loosening up a bit. A bit. That's a good description, just exactly what you said. A bit.